Zion and Babylon. Zion and Babylon. Both are terms that uh, we're very familiar with. Both are terms that the Bible often talks about. Both are real places here on the earth. Places that have a history and a people and that we can actually go and look at and, and respond to. But as well as places here on earth, Zion and Babylon are also spiritual entities, I guess, for lack of a better word, spiritual bodies. And they too have their own history and their own head and their own structure. Zion, Zion is the body of our Lord, the bride, Israel, the called out ones, the ecclesia all of the called out ones who are in fellowship and relationship with the living God. Zion is a living organization consisting of those called and born anew supernaturally by the Spirit of Almighty God. Now Babylon too in the Spirit is a real entity, a real place, a real person, I suppose I could say, with a head and a body as well. Babylon is the false religious systems, the harlot that rides the dragon that we read about throughout Scripture from the early part all the way to the end. Babylon is false religious systems and traditions of men made and established to glorify self and to give an outlet to this urge that all men have within them to worship and to create realities. Babylon aside from being or away, apart from being a people called out unto a special relationship Babylon consists of the people who willingly joined into this system for reasons that have mostly to do with themselves and almost nothing to do with Almighty God. Zion, in the spiritual sense, has a history as well as does Babylon. And they also, as well, have a real history here on Earth. We can follow the history of Zion because it begins with the call of Abraham. Both of these terms, I should add at this point, I didn't say it earlier, both of these terms relate to specific times. They are both related to post-flood times, from the time of the flood until the return of our Lord these, t these uh, terms will have significance. They have no sig significance to the time before and very limited significance, I believe, to the times after. But for in the world we live, Zion and Babylon. Zion and Babylon are the two most real entities of spiritual life that we come in contact with and that we are a part of in our walk in this world. Now Zion, as I said, Zion has a history that begins with the call of Abraham. Babylon too has a history. Babylon has a history that begins before the city of Babylon. It begins long before that on the plains of Shinar, perhaps a hundred years or maybe less before the city of Babylon had begun. So let me take you back there and begin to lay the groundwork for what we're going to look at this afternoon. After the flood, the land of Shinar was settled by Cush and his descendants. And Cush was a, a warrior. He used uh, the black arts, according to traditions and according to some of the histories. 
He had those that delved into the black arts of witchcraft in order to give him tactical and other advantages over the other peoples that settled on parts of settled other parts of the earth, so that he could overcome them and build himself a great empire, which in fact he did. Kush built an empire that ran from the land of Shinar, right on the borders of Iran, all the way down across northern Egypt, northern uh, Africa, down all the way into Ethiopia. As a matter of fact, up until almost modern times, the land of Ethiopia was still called by the name of Kush. Well, Kush's ambition knew, knew no bounds, as, as with most military conquerors. And so he made an excursion late in his life to the east, into Iran and into Afghanistan and ultimately into India. And here, according to the ancient records, he suffered a devastating military defeat. And in his shame, he started trudging back home with what was left of his army, disheveled, discouraged, embittered, a defeated man. None of the pride and the arrogance with which he left did he come back with. And when he entered his own country, coming across into the borders of the land of Shinar. He passed a small trading post that had been there for many, many years on the edge of his country. It was a uh, frequent stop for the caravans as they went either way, for diplomats, for military, and for whoever happened to be passing through on the road for whatever reason. And he stopped there. And here he met a young woman, a very young woman. By today's standards, we would call her a mere girl. She was uh, probably about 12 years old, maybe 13, just coming into her, into her period of development. And of course, at this time, back in the ancient world, that was when most women were married off. But this young lady was a little bit different. She was not a part of the family of the tavern. She had been purchased by the tavern owner when she was little more than an infant, just a toddler, from her parents who were passing, passing through and uh, did not need the excess baggage of another girl. And so they sold, him to the, sold her to the tavern owner and he willingly bought because he, uh, he looked into the future and he could see the uh, economic benefits that could accrue from this. And as she grew, she became adept at the things that the young ladies were meant to become adept at in taverns of those days. She became a dancer, she became a seer, she practiced the arts of witchcraft, and by the time she was 12, she was already an accomplished prostitute. But Simiramis had something else that the other girls around there did not have. Simiramis had an ambition born born from a unification with a spiritual entity. But none of the others could match. She had a drive and an ambition. She had powers in the dark world because she had spent years honing her crafts of witchcraft in order to bring to her what she felt would make her life of drudgery somewhat easier. She was an angry, embittered woman who wanted vengeance on all of those who she felt had used her and put her into the situation she was in. And so in her witchcraft, she struggled and she constantly went after entities and spiritual beings that could give her power. And one day, imagine her surprise when a spirit seemingly was delivered to her doorstep. And in fact, as we will discuss later, it was indeed delivered to her doorstep, prepared and ready for her. For Almighty God knew that this day would come, and he allowed it because man had to be tested. The corruption had to be reintroduced because if there was no corruption, there could be no salvation. For to be redeemed means that we must come out of the corruption that we were born into. A 
Now you can imagine the shock, surprise, and then eventually the delight in Semiramis's eyes and in her spirit. As in her conjuring, she conjured up a spirit of wickedness that had a message for her and a proposition for her. The spirit told her, come to me and I will make you a mighty woman. Come to me and I will make you devoted by all people. I will make you loved around the world. Your name will be synonymous with holiness and worship. Semiramis was beguiled. And more than beguiled, she was convinced. And so she did the unthinkable, what no one had done since before the flood. She allowed her body and her soul to be corrupted by this demon, by a process that we would nowadays call recombinant DNA, which seems complicated, but in reality is a simple procedure, a procedure done in high schools across the country by ninth and 10th grade biology students. And the evil spirits, the fallen angels, they needed only a quick acknowledge, a quick yes from her because the technology already existed. They had been doing this thing for thousands and thousands of years throughout the pre-flood era. This is the very thing that had corrupted the very genome of man and had forced the flood to begin with. And here sat this girl who in her anger and in her ambition threw herself at the feet of the evil spirit of harlotry. And she became one. She became one with a demon. She became one, it wasn't a demon, excuse me. She became one with the fallen angel of harlotry, the fallen spirit of religion and false religion. And Samaramis began to form around her a small cult of people who began to imbibe on the things that she had seen and the things that she had partaken of. And it was in this time that Cush, the defeated, dejected king, came through her spot, through her tavern at the trading post there on the edge of Shinar. And she was not a, a girl who couldn't see opportunity when, she, when it was right in front of her. She could see the condition and the shape of the king. She knew her own ambition, and above all, she knew her own talents. So using the talents she had learned, the arts of dance, witchcraft, and prostitution, she beguiled her way inside the heart of the king himself, inside of the mind and the body of Cush. And Cush married her and impregnated her. And this son, this son would become the first half-breed, born naturally again on the earth since before the flood. This son whose name we all know so well, his name was Nimrod. And as Nimrod grew, he was obviously different from other men, more powerful, swifter, stronger, bigger, handsomer. In every way, Nimrod was a special, a special man. And as he grew, and Cush grew older, the bond between mother and son began to intensify and become something beyond what a bond between a mother and son should ever be. They began to be together constantly. There began to be romantic stories told about them. And they began to proliferate a religious system built on the structures shown to Semiramis by the evil spirit, intended to corrupt the minds and the hearts and the souls of those around her and to spread itself. As Cush was becoming an old man and he saw what was happening, he went away in disgust and shame 
rejected by his people for a younger, more virile man. He went into what would amount to a monastic recluse from which he never recovered and died some short time after that. And this left Samaramis and Nimrod free to build their own empires, their own systems. And this is the time when the Bible talks about Nimrod attempting to unite all mankind under the single worship system that his wife, or his mother, who was soon to become his wife, had set up in her bargaining with the spirit of religion. And here they founded the city of Babylon. And here at Babylon the two were married. And here at Babylon they built their tower and their attempt to corrupt all man. But we know the story. We know that God, that God, I don't want to say frustrated their plans when he confused the languages of earth and sent everybody off in their own direction back to their own lands. But this didn't deter Semiramis and Nimrod. They set out on military conquest. They were going to conquer the people if they could not convince them because of the same language to reunite. I mean unification with unification is the way they looked at it and if we can't do it with your agreement we'll do it over your protest and we'll do it with military and we don't care how much blood we spill. And they set out on rapid areas of conquest and the Bible tells us that Nimrod, Nimrod established other cities around and he became such a corruption in the face of the earth that the bands of people who were not yet under his thumb got together under the auspices of Seth who was then still alive but a very old man yet a powerful warrior in his own life in his own right and Seth forged a group of 72 men 72 one from each village and he brought a headman from each village and they got together and they trapped Nimrod and they slew Nimrod north of the plains of Shinar slew him dead and according to their agreement that they had made that he might not come back again that he might not rise again they cut his body up they cut it up into 72 pieces is what the ancient records tell us and each one of these chieftains took it back to a different part of the earth to spread it and bury it and hide it away that he might never be found again. Now when this happened, this, this seriously upset the plans of Semiramis to begin to build a religious kingdom with her and Nimrod as its head to gain the kind of power and prestige and adoration that she had wanted all her life. But Semiramis was a quick-thinking young lady. And she had the wisdom of the wisdom of evil on her side. And quickly she formed a new plan. Because she knew that without Nimrod, she was destined, destined to fall on her face. But what they did, what they did here in the plains of Shinar was to corrupt the prophecies of the Bible. You see, all people knew of the prophecy of the Bible in the third chapter of Genesis, where it said that Satan would bruise the heel, but the seed of the woman would bruise Satan's head and gain redemption. And re redemption, there we go, gain redemption. And thereby doing this for all mankind. So Semiramis immediately, under the sponsorship of her evil spirit, sent out ambassadors all over the world and they tried to recover all of the various parts of Nimrod, but they could not get them all. They recovered everything except Nimrod's penis. And they reassembled Nimrod there in Babylon and buried him there. But about three months later, Semiramis turns up mysteriously pregnant again. Pregnant again. And she declared it was pregnant through the hands of Nimrod, reassembled there. 
Nimrod had become a god through his death. Nimrod had defeated the powers of Satan and now was assuring mankind of their resurrection through his rebirth as his own son inseminated after his death. This was the evidence and this was the lie that they sent forth. That the prophecy had been fulfilled. That mankind was restored. That sin no longer held its evil sway. That Nimrod was God in the flesh. He had been slain to pay the price of the sins and the fall of Adam. And he had been reborn, resurrected into the new life of his son, Tammuz. And this is the birth of the mystery religious system. This is the birth of the father and the son in the culture of mankind in the flesh. This is the birth of the harlot that rides the dragon here on the plains of Shinar. And she sent out her ambassadors to spread the good news all across the known world at this time. And they went to all locations to inform everyone that the prophecy had been fulfilled, that God had come back to earth in the form of Nimrod. He had allowed himself to be slain as a sacrifice to redeem mankind. And he had given the promise and the fulfillment of this promise in the miraculous birth of his son, Tammuz, who was in fact Almighty God Nimrod himself reborn within the flesh. And this is the gospel that they sent out around the world. And they did more than this. Everywhere they went, they erected a physical witness and testimony to this religion, to this... How should I say it? It wasn't a church. To this system of belief with which they were going to try and conquer and take over the world. And at every place where her ambassadors went, they erected a statue of the penis of Nimrod. It was a symbol of the fertility of God. It was supposed to be a symbol of his conquest of evil, of his redeeming through his own sacrifice and the resurrection of life in his own son. Now these statues of Nimrod's penis were scattered all across the ancient world. We have seen them over and over again. But we have come to know them as obelisks, standing stones, or piles of rock. This is the witness that spread around the world. This is the witness that corrupted, that corrupted insatiably in every society. For all men knew of the story of Adam. All men were related closely enough at this time to someone who had survived the flood. For they were still alive and those that weren't their children were. For the lifespans were much greater according to the Bible then. They did not begin to slow down until after this time. And this corruption spread around the world and was absolutely complete at the time when God called Abraham to come out of what was then a part of the land of Shinar into a land that he would show him that he would make him a people and a bloodline through which true salvation would come. The world did not recognize this. The world did not know this. Now you know what's interesting? We have a full history in the Word of God about the calling of Abraham, the creation of 
of Zion. But people say it's all hearsay about Babylon. But there's nothing in the Bible there. They don't see it. But they're wrong, my friends. We are given a full vision in the Word of God about what happened here on the plains of Shinar. You know, all of the visions in the in the Word of God given to the given to the prophets were not always visions of the future or even visions of the present. There are times we were given visions of the past so that we would know the situation we are in, why we are here, what has been done. If it were not for these visions, we would know very little about the war in the heavens, the revolt of Satan, and his being cast into Tartarus. These are a part of the visions given to the prophets that we may understand where we are and the fight that we are in. And there is such a vision in the book of Zechariah that I believe describes what happened here on the plains of Shinar. You must remember at the time this happened, the flood had just passed. Within three or four hundred years, all people were aware of the histories. All people knew what was going, what had happened. All people knew why it had happened. This was all put forward to them in great clarity by their ancestors who had survived the flood. And listen to me as I read the this chapter, chapter, as I read from the book of Zechariah, beginning in chapter 5 from the fifth verse. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. And he said, Moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. And this is a woman that sittest in the midst of the ephah. And he said, This is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah. And he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came two women. And the wind was in their wings, for they had the wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. Then said I unto the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? And she said unto me, To build it a house in the land of Shinar, that it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Now let me go through these a little bit, the, the verses here, so that you can understand what I'm trying to say and what the Lord has said to us. Verse 5 is very self-explanatory. We don't need to go there. But verse 6, and he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. Moreover, this is their resemblance throughout all the earth. An ephah is a measuring instrument. Uh, a basket, something like a bushel basket. It was meant to measure the weight of grains or the volume of grains. But the basket part is not what we're meant to focus on. It is the ephah itself is the measure. And an ephah is a full measure. This is a full measure of evil within the basket, within, within the measuring container. And the reason why the Bible says this is their resemblance throughout all the earth is because before the flood, the earth was populated by millions, perhaps billions of people. And virtually every one of them had been corrupted by the seed of the serpent. And if you are corrupted genetically, you are not only possessed, you are perfectly possessed. You are no longer human. You are another entity altogether. Now the flood destroyed all living creatures across the earth that was not inside the inside the, uh, the Ark of Noah. Therefore all of these evil and wicked spirits had no place to go. They were all imprisoned, trapped within the confines of Tartarus. As this soul was trapped within the Epal, they were all imprisoned, waiting for those that they could get out and possess. But they had to wait. They had to wait for the timing 
presence of God to allow the reinfusion of evil within the world. This is why. This is why we are told here that there was a resemblance through all the earth. They were waiting in order to be let loose. But the first one to be let loose was the spirit of religion, the spirit of harlotry, the one we're talked about in the word. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. And this is a woman that sits in the midst of the ephah. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. This is the evil spirit of false religion, the evil spirit that we have come to know as the Babylonian system. And she wanted to escape so badly that just as the angel tilted the lid so that Zechariah could see inside the ephah, the spirit tried to escape at that very minute. And the angel had to force it or cast it back into the midst of the ephah. Now what was this weird, wicked spirit doing within the basket outside of the confines of Tartarus? She was there because she was being transported because preparations had been made for her new home. Listen as we go on. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold there came out two women and the wind was in their wings for they had wings like the wings of a stork and they lifted up the ephah between the heaven and the earth. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, To build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. When Zechariah lifted up his eyes and he looked, behold, there became two women. These were obviously angelic beings, for they were flying. That's what the it means when it says the wind is in their wings. They were either flying or they were fluttering their wings in preparation to fly. But they were not angelic beings that we would think of having, as having come from Almighty God. They were in fact fallen beings. We know this because of his description. For they had the wings like the wings of a stork. A stork is an unclean animal. And clearly, the representation of a stork with these angels is meant to tell us that they were unclean beings. And they lifted up the ephah between heaven and earth. They were flying it to its destination. And its destination was the land of Shinar, to build it a house. Now we all know from our dealings with the Spirit of God that a spiritual being does not need a house of mud, bricks, stone, wood, mortar, or anything else. A spirit being, in order to live, needs a house of flesh and blood. This was the house that was being provided and built for her in Shinar. This was where it was being established in the city that was being prepared in the land of Shinar. And Semiramis is the young woman who became the house who was prepared to set up this demon on her own base within her own body in return for power, influence, and glory, all that would accrue to her. She is perhaps one of the most famous women of all time because of her deal. Every time we see a statue like what's on top of the, the Congress, the Statue of Liberty, the Madonna. These are all images of Semiramis. The Virgin and Child that we see throughout the church systems are all images of Semiramis and Tammuz. The corruption that began in one spot on the earth has grown and proliferated through the infusion for where one spirit united with one person as they grew 
as they're created priesthoods, as each little establishment of this religion developed around the obelisks and stone pilings that were placed to represent the penis of, of Nimrod and the resurrection granted through this mysterious penis and his rebirth as his son to Moose. As each establishment was set up, it has its own spiritual leadership that came from the evil side. And each of these priests, priestesses, had to go through the same procedure as Semiramis. Therefore we see the seed of the serpent being spread again through mankind, through the base of false religion and its entrance here in the plains of Shinar. This is the vision that Zechariah was given so that we would know and understand the magnitude of the calamity that has come upon us and the depth, the depth of the evil. And indeed, it spread we only have to look into the books of Zechari into the books of Ezekiel and the other prophets to see how this spread, pulling down the hatred and the anger of Almighty God Himself, as this evil system spread across all of the earth, even corrupting the very land of Zion itself. Though always in the hand of God, there was a remnant who had not bound the knee to this system of religion. And in the fullness of Babylon, there came a time when the true Lord came. The true Lord came, paid the price, lived the life before God through the power of the Spirit, became the sacrifice, and was resurrected on the third day. The true witness brought a light into the world. A light that shined over and against and opposed the darkness of the systems of Babylon. And for a great glorious shining moment, the Ecclesia of Almighty God stood out in perfection in its opposition to the systems of Babylon and the sin of Semiramis. Yet this could not be allowed to to stay this way. Corruption. Corruption was inserted into the very heart of the church. The leaven was placed into the midst of the very first loaf. In this glorious light that was spreading through the body of our risen Lord was soon to be corrupted with the same spiritual sin as the sin of Semiramis on Babylon. How did this happen, you can say? Well, our Lord foretold it in His parables. But you see, my friends, the story of the corruption of the body of Christ. And I shouldn't say the body of Christ. I should say the church. Because the creation of the church became a separate entity from the creation of the Ecclesia. The Ecclesia, the called out ones of Almighty God, are created, sustained, and nourished by the living God Himself through the blood of Christ. But the church, the church was a corruption that came upon the Ecclesia overwhelmed them and spread its system of vileness and corruption again around the world, only this time in the name of our risen Lord. How did this happen, you can say? Well, there is a character, there is a seed we can go and look to. Just as there is with Semiramis, there was a seed, there was a person, there was a point where evil entered into. And 
it is so in the church. There is a person. There is a point. There is a seed of corruption that was within the church at its earliest beginnings. But this, my friends, this is another story. And this will be what we talk about in part two of this series on the church corrupted, which I think I'm going to entitle Dark Church. Thank you, Father, for giving us thy word, for allowing us to understand the corruption that is around us, for giving us the vision and the light to see it. In the next episode, my friends, the next episode of this series anyway, because there may be others in between. I've got some, some more research and work to do before I go to the this part. We will talk about how the seed of corruption entered the church. And as with a little bit of leaven, how it soon corrupted almost the entire loaf. So that only a remnant, as with the, as with the uh, nation of Israel, as has been historically true with Zion throughout all ages, corruption comes in and only a remnant are left. But that's the story for the next time. <laughs> Until then, my friends, I'm starting to wear out in all the heat and sitting here. Until then, my friends, have a wonderful, wonderful day in our risen Lord. Amen. Goodbye.